Welcome back to the channel. Thank you for watching and liking my videos. And of course, thank you for subscribing. So after the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, lots of people have asked questions about how a lawyer should conduct themselves in court and out of court and the type of questions that they can and cannot ask in court and how they ought to behave out of court and what they can and cannot say about their clients. So I would like to go through a few of those in this video because there are quite a few interesting comments and questions that have come up in other videos. So let's get right to it. So first of all, whichever jurisdiction you are in, now I'm a barrister in England and Wales, but whether you're from England and Wales, the US or any other legal jurisdiction, each will have a code of conduct specific to that jurisdiction, which every lawyer and certainly practicing lawyers will sign up to this code of conduct and must behave in this way in accordance with the code of conduct at all times. There are certain bits of it that only apply when you are in court or representing your client and there are certain bits of it that apply at all times. One of those is usually to uphold the trust and integrity in the profession. But one of those is also always not to mislead the court. So again, whichever jurisdiction you are in, you have these duties. And as a barrister of England and Wales, these are codified within what is called the Bar Standards Board Handbook, which is a set of rules which is very detailed and governs how you must and must not behave in and out of court. So suffice to say, I've been a little bit disappointed with all respect with some legal academics and with some lawyers with what they've said and how they've said it in and out of court. Let me give you an example, but I'm going to use our code of conduct as a basis for that example. For example, we have one rule in our code of conduct, which is titled not abusing your role as an advocate. Advocate, of course, meaning barrister, lawyer, attorney, or whatever. And in a training session I did with a high court judge not too long ago, he said the barrister, or of course, attorney, is the most powerful person in the courtroom. That is because Everyone must listen to each question carefully posed by the lawyer, the barrister, the attorney, and the witness must answer that question. And so for the full period of asking questions, the lawyer has control of the courtroom. Everyone must listen to it. The judge can correct questions or ask to rephrase questions and opposing counsel can object to questions. If, for example, they are leading in evidence in chief, or if they are badgering and insulting in cross-examination. And so with that, I'm going to our code of conduct, which we have a rule called RC7. R means it's a rule. G would normally mean guidance, but R is a rule, RC7. This rule states that where you're acting as an advocate, your duty not to abuse your role includes the following obligations. One, you must not make statements or ask questions merely to insult, humiliate, or annoy a witness or any other person. So this obviously applies within the courtroom. So if you are in court and you ask a question of a witness, it must be to elicit facts or a response to a specific question relating to the case. It cannot simply be to insult or annoy the witness. For example, if you were to ask a witness, you don't take care of your appearance, do you? That's clearly to insult and intimidate and humiliate a witness that would not be a proper question. If the facts of the case surrounded the type of clothing that they wear, and let's say they always wear labeled branded clothing, and you were making the case that this is their lifestyle, and then you phrase the question, you only wear X, Y, or Z branded clothing. That's right, isn't it? Then that would be a proper question because it's not designed to insult or humiliate. Whereas the first way around, it would simply be to annoy or humiliate the witness. And this is against our rules. And I'm sure in the US, maybe some of my uh, international audience can tell me below in your jurisdiction, whether you have a similar rule that you shouldn't ask questions just to annoy or humiliate a witness. The second part of this rule is that you cannot make a serious allegation against any witness if you've had an opportunity to cross-examine them unless you've given that witness the opportunity to respond to that allegation during said cross-examination. In other words, very simply put, if you want to say that a witness is lying about something in their evidence, you must put that to the witness in your cross-examination so that when you make your submissions to the judge or the jury, then they've had an opportunity to respond to it. Otherwise, it would be unfair. Picture this, you get to the end of a trial, you're making your jury speech and you say, members of the jury, this man is clearly lying in his evidence to you. That man might be sitting in the public gallery and may object to the fact that you are accusing him of lying because he was on the witness stand or in the witness box for a period of time and he would feel that if you posed that question, he would have denied it. 
And that's the idea. You give that witness the opportunity to respond to that question so that you can still make the allegation to the jury or the judge, but the witness has had an opportunity to explain why he says he hasn't lied in his evidence and why he says that it's true. And so to make that allegation without giving them the opportunity would be abusing your role as an advocate. Because as I said at the outset, you have the most power in the courtroom because you choose the questions and you put your arguments and submissions to the jury or the judge, as the case might be. The fourth element of this rule is also interesting. And again, perhaps there's an international equivalent. Maybe my international lawyer friends can tell me in the comments below. But number four states that you must not put forward to the court a personal opinion of the facts or the law unless you are invited or required to do so by the court or by law. Now, there are certain cases where we are required by law or by rules to put forward our opinion on a certain case. One of those is if a child has been injured and the parties are trying to settle the matter with an amount of damages, an amount of money in compensation for that child's injuries. This cannot be agreed without counsel's opinion and this must be put to the court by counsel in court and the court will receive opinion from both counsel on either side before the court comes to a determination of what amount of damages is reasonable. These in England and Wales are called infant settlement hearings. So it is a hearing designed to settle the damages, the amount of compensation payable where a child has been injured. But otherwise, as I often say in my videos, no one cares about your opinion and no one cares about your emotions, save for certain elements of offences where if you are in fear of injury or fear of attack or fear of harm, this in England and Wales at least is pertinent to robbery, which distinguishes robbery from other offences. There is an element of fear involved there and that is one time when somebody's fear and their emotions very much do come into play here. We have another rule and again there's probably an international equivalent which is that you must not do anything that could be reasonably seen by the public to undermine your honesty, integrity or independence. So again, applying whilst you're instructed by a client or whilst you're in court, you must not do anything that can be reasonably seen by members of the public to undermine your honesty, your integrity, or your independence. Very simple example would be if it looks like you're trying to manipulate evidence or you're trying to manipulate the outcome of a trial or you're trying to manipulate public perception of the outcome of a trial in such a way that it may compromise your honesty, integrity, or independence. Again, this is against the rules. And again, there's probably an international equivalent which certainly we hold dear in England and Wales. When it comes to speaking to the media of course lawyers can talk to the media it wasn't always the case in England and Wales but we can now and you can give your personal opinions so long as you're not undermining or conflicting with your clients confidentiality or as I said previously bringing the profession into disrepute by things that you say because one of the rules that applies all the time for lawyers, and this is why I say when you sign up to be a lawyer, you sign up to this code of conduct, and some of these apply at all times, regardless of whether you are currently acting for a client in a case in court. And so one of these rules is that you must not do anything, as I said, to bring the profession into disrepute. So this rule applies at all times. So if you are making statements to the press, you must not do or say anything that will bring the profession into disrepute. This is different to drawing arguments and raising questions and analyzing cases, analyzing facts and arguments and things like that. Whereas if you were to behave erratically, insulting people online with grotesque messages, then this certainly for the purposes of our code of conduct would almost certainly bring the profession into disrepute. This is different to just stating opinions online and it's different to just exercising your freedom of speech because there is and there may sometimes be a conflict between the right to have freedom of speech, which we certainly have here. I know you do internationally. But again, as I say, your right to freedom of speech is one thing, but it may sometimes come into conflict with your duty not to bring the profession into disrepute. So whilst you may see in some films where the lawyer is being incredibly argumentative or sarcastic or aggressive with a witness on the stand or in the witness box, that's generally, as you've seen from recent televised trials, that's generally not how it really works or not how it should work. Questions should always be put respectfully, sometimes forcefully if necessary, if the witness is evading or not answering the question, 
very often the witness will answer a different question, not the question that you asked. So very often you would have heard Camille Vasquez saying, that wasn't my question. My question was this. And that might happen two or three times if the witness just avoids the question. And then when necessary, the judge might step in and say, please answer the question that's been put to you rather than something else. So I hope that's a brief insight into the etiquette and professionalism of lawyers, some of which recently portrayed in the media I've been very pleased with, and some of which I've not been so pleased with. But if you like this kind of analysis of the rules and professionalism and etiquette, please do drop a like and subscribe on this video. I'd be really grateful for that. And if you like this kind of content, let me know what you'd like to see more of, and of course I will do that. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for watching.